show is live brought to you by outbase.nz good evening good morning if you're listening to this in the morning or good afternoon if you're listening to this in the afternoon if you're watching us right now you're live on youtube so if you are on youtube make sure to subscribe to our channel to support the platform you can now become a member as well so there's a little button just below the player written uh where it's written join and you can give us some dollars to support the team so we can keep bringing amazing people to have inspiring conversations. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen. This is show number 113. It's been a cool journey. We're learning heaps. We're talking to cool people and it's a pleasure to have you guys on board. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And we also have our second channel, the Alt Base Clips, where we break down the chats into smaller clips. So if you don't have time for the whole thing, you can watch some of the highlights. Cool. As I said, we're also, of course, a podcast. So we are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Prime. So if you're doing your thing, if you're washing the dishes, mowing the malls, and you can... You want to listen to Mr. Roberts and Leo and all the beautiful guys here on this show? You can. Speaking of Mr. Roberts, hi. How you doing? Oh, man, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. I'm just wondering, do you sleep talk with that opening <coughs> spiel? If you said that opening spiel 130, 113 times now, do you just say it when you're thinking about something without? Are you baking and singing that? Click subscribe and you can support us and all the audio-based platforms. Also, if you're watching uh, or listening at 11 o'clock or later, go to bed. Uh, you need to be well rested for your children. Or if you are a child, you need to be well rested to be a child. How many hours do you sleep per night? Oh, I like to be in bed by 9.30, trying to get to sleep. Which doesn't happen often, eh? No, it's, it's pretty common. I, I yeah. like my sleep. I value it. Stuff staying up late. I just get grumpy. Unless the cricket's on. And the kids let you sleep? The kids are really good at sleeping, actually. It took a long time. A lot of training, a lot of repetition. <laughs> A yep. lot of routine. When the kids are sick, routine goes out the window, but they're pretty decent. They're really good sleepers. That's good. And you're looking good. You, you're biking now. You're riding your bike. Yeah, I went on year 10 camp and I discovered that I had something I enjoyed about physical activity. The first time I'd enjoyed physical activity in years. Um, Congratulations. And I got to, thank you. And I got to beat several of my students um, <gasps> up on the mountain biking trip. As I said to them many times on the trek, I don't care what place I come as long as I beat you. And um, I think that took it in the right way. <laughs> Great. Um, how how good were you uh, with history at school? Terrible. Never took the subject. Um, I never really cared for history mm. until I got to university and had to learn um, my postgrad years philosophy. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's always history of music, which I did, but it never went back past you know, early 20th century. Um, I only dabbled briefly in classical music. So really, when I started having to do philosophy, I had to look back at who these old people are, reading the name Descartes and then discovering it's Descartes only in an embarrassing <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Fantastic. Those sorts of scenarios. Do you value history a bit more now that you're an old man? I am rather old. Um, I'm going to be 31 on Wednesday, which is going to be interesting. <laughs> what? Whoa, our guest is even like, wow, yeah, what? I'm, uh, that close, old. That's right, closer to 60 than conception. It's, a, it's an interesting age to be. Um, but... Uh, you went slow there, Taylor. Great. I gave you one joke and you didn't uh, you, you didn't respond in time. But yeah, I, th I think I enjoy history. I, I like looking back at the history of uh, sport. Uh, so like cricket as a history, I love learning about how that started in terms of a wicket fence, creating the area where you could play cricket on. There wouldn't be livestock, wouldn't go over it. So that's interesting to learn. You, know, you can't wait for us to have a, a, a cricket player here on this show, eh? It would God be great. Well, I am actually wearing the Black Caps training gear from a couple of years ago. It's a bit snug. From the audio platform, it's definitely <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, around my shapely form. Okay. Uh, but the big uh, shout out to the, the Black Caps on a Saturday night, thrashing Australia. I enjoyed every minute of that. It was just pure bliss. God, please, no! <laughs> Kids wearing... <laughs> The t-shirt of the team doesn't make you a professional player. Okay, just so you remember. Right, David? 
Yes, I understand that. I just want to say thank you to our <laughs> friends from Brazil <laughs> who gave me this beautiful hat from Wanda Su. Thanks for hair. It's beautiful man doing amazing work, meaningful work in Brazil. Brazil is going through a tough time with the elections. We couldn't have worse options to choose from. Is Bolsonaro still running? The devil is still running, yes. So it's not looking good for us. That's How his pet name, is it? The devil. The devil, yes. That's what his wife calls him. Yeah, you, you, oh man, yeah. Hey devil. Oh, the other day, okay. So so she was doing her thing, you know, like because now is the time that they're friendly to everyone and nice oh, yeah. to everyone. And she does a lot of work with like um, kids with disabilities and mm. accessibilities and all that stuff. And then I'm not joking, okay? This is, this is true. So she's, doing this like this big talk to a lot of people and then she's like oh i just want to say before we start i'm so sorry we could not get the accessibility right here on this place today but uh for for all the deaf people uh, are there any deaf people here in the room can, can can any can any deaf people like raise your hand i'm not joking so this is the level of of the country where I'm from. Thanks, Aotearoa, for taking me. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. And I feel actually very inspired that tonight we're going to learn some more, Mr. Fabian. I actually just have one more comment. When I first met you, you um, oh, in the early days, like the first year or so, we, we slowly warmed up to each other as you realized that my satire was pleasant um, and not revolting. But you showed me a video of Bolsonaro kissing children in a crowd, you know, doing a campaign. And then at one point you realized, did you see it? And I went, what? And you said that wasn't a child, it was a dwarf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the person, was, and yeah. the person was like, "Oh, wait, don't, don't pick me up. What's going on?" And he sort of seized up, and he kissed the dwarf. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So that's the current president of Brazil. So like, if you think New Zealand yeah. is bad, man, like you have no clue, man. Like, go to bed and be thankful every night for being New Zealand. And actually, there's one other shout out and reminder. Tomorrow is uh, Tuesday. Um, International Dwarf Recognition, is that the general yes, celebration, recognition? Um, and wearing green, I believe is the general theme. So right? yeah, and um, I think uh, everyone at school was uh, being promoted. So if you are well, watching live, um, do your homework, go to bed at a good hour and wear green tomorrow. Yeah, and if you don't want to be carried by a president, don't go to Brazil, yeah, I mean, stay in New Zealand. It was just such a shocking thing. Like you can't pick up a human and then shake them and the kiss and like a big smile for the cameras and then like a drop throw to the mother that wasn't existing it was just so bad it's a pleasure it's a great night here for us very special because we have bex cox hey bex hey how are you <laughs> good how are you good good bex yep. couldn't like she was like i can't believe this conversation is happening <laughs> just before we have this beautiful inspiring conversation about aotearoa yeah. where are these guys going how are you bex <laughs> i'm good i'm good yeah yeah had a good day at the museum so that was good good yep. do you yeah. like our space do you like the I studio do. it's very um hmm. Ray, I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. How are things going at the museum? Yes, slow and steady. Slow and steady. Yeah. A bit yeah. of a hit during the pandemic? Very much so. Uh, actually, the first year wasn't too bad. We went, um, we normally get around six and a half thousand visitors a year into the museum, which mm -hmm. is, we are the biggest museum on the peninsula, really. Um, and that first year after we all come out of lockdown and good old Cindy told us to go and travel the New Zealand um, we got an extra 2,000 people so we got up and over nearly 8,000 people through the door in a year which was fantastic and then Omicron came wandering in and um, we got down to only four and a half thousand last year so we we did kind of take a big hit so we're hoping that this year that you know people will come back and um, we are seeing the Australian visitors back in um, English so they are coming back so it'll be really nice for them to come and visit us awesome and i and i must say um that i'm i'm always amazed by like the work that you guys do in the museum because okay. i've been here for almost nine years and yeah. it took me a while to actually <laughs> go to the museum yeah. i knew what it was because it's a beautiful strategic spot close yeah. to the the marina close yeah. to the wharf so i knew it was there and i love going to museums but i think like it it's kind of like like the beach sometimes for me i know that it's there and yep. I feel like I take it for granted, which yep. is a shame. So I try not to. Yep. So I think I, it took me time to get to the museum. Museum, And when I was there, I was like, this is rich. This is like solid. Yeah. It's an amazing space. So yep. thanks for the, doing that. It's all right. It's all right. Well, I love my job. So, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and this is the Mercury Bay Museum. Mercury Bay Museum. Yes. Yeah, on the yes. Esplanade. Yes. Yes. Down there by the 
and by the wharf. Yep. And if you want to see how butter is made, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yes. Come in and check out our butter churn. Yeah. So, so just just before we get into all the the, the beautiful details and like peculiarities, I would say about our, the place where we live, yep. for the people who come to the Coromando and they, you know, they have so many cool things to do, and then you're like, oh wow, should we go to the museum? What? How important is the Mercury Bay? How important is the place where we are to Aotearoa's history? Wow, 1769. I mean, need I say more? You know, um, Captain James Cook uh, visited here in 1769 um, on the crew of the eight with on the boat the HM, HMB Endeavour, not the HMS, um, along with um, Charles Green, um, Daniel Solander, um, and other members of his crew. So they spent 12 days here in Mercury Bay, um, anchored off of Purangi, um, and that 12 days was the first sustained period of time that he stayed in one place um he had been to gisborne first um but he didn't st he didn't actually anchor there and go on to land he did a couple of times was gisborne the first place then that, yeah. that in, in history yeah 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 um and then um he came here so 12 days here um and you know really important things happened uh the transit of mercury um was viewed here um the porphyry so the very first um, Paul Fody, he was invited um, onto um, Fori Taiwa Pa um, by Chief Torwaka. Um, and that was the first time that a European had actually been invited or part to be part of a Paul Fody. Um So really, really important stuff. Yeah. That must have been fascinating because a Paul Fody would have been a custom that was held oh, yeah. for a long time before that event. Yep, yep. As a, as a, a settler or a, a visitor coming in, Mm. You don't speak the language. No. no. They must be preparing themselves for n customs that are not their own, but because it's quite a strict. Uh, the poor hoodie I've grown up with, there is a custom. There is places for men and women. There's space, location. There are demonstrations of the local area and the strengths and. Like, how, how do they cope with that type of thing? Is that something that can be spoken about? Like how um, how they responded in the poor hoodie? Yeah, they were. Um, lucky in a sense that they actually when they stopped in uh, Tahiti on their way through um, they actually um, Joseph Banks um, had a conversation with a gentleman called Tupaya um, mm. and Tupaya um, was a priest and a navigator in his own right um, and so Joseph Banks went to Cook and said look I want to bring Tupaya along with us um, and Tupaya um, came from Tapu Tapu Ate. Um, and so he um, he knew of the land down here. He knew that there was something down here. Um, and so the belief is is that he helped guide um, Cook down to Aotearoa um, because Cook's uh, Cook was given an envelope when he'd finished um, the Tahitian um, his Tahitian time um, when he'd done the um, transit of Venus. He was then given secret orders that he opened um, and told him to go looking for this mass of land at the bottom of the world. Um, oh, and if you're down there at a certain date, November the 5th, 9th, somewhere, 9th, somewhere around there, please find some land and do the transit of Mercury while you're there. So um, he he headed this way and they had Tupaya on board. Now Tupaya Tahitian language, very similar, um, so could communicate. Um, and so he would have had some understanding of some of the um, the way that the porphyry um, would have, you know, and some of the, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of, um, customary mm. kind of ways things are done, you know, done. So um, he would have been talking to him the whole time, um, we believe. So That's fascinating because you think the idea of misinterpreting because some of the displays, I remember growing up, they were impressive, they were amazing. I thought they were really yeah. just cool to see yeah. uh, growing up. But I can imagine coming to a new land, as visitors, mm. that can be quite intimidating. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, I'd call to have a, yeah. Yeah. a translator so with you or a, a, an experienced well, traveller. Well, exactly. He was an experienced traveller. That's, you know, and Coupe. I mean, Coupe, 950 AD-ish, kind of came to um, Mercury Bay as well, came into this area, um, and hence the name Tapi Tapu Atea, um, which is his marae from um, Tahiti. Um, and so when I started looking into Tupaya and realised, hey, hang on, Coupe, Tapu Tapu Atea, Tahiti, Navigation, Coupe went back. 
which is very rare. Navigators didn't tend to kind of mm-hmm. go back, so he went back, told his people that then got passed down in the line um, to Pyre, then was starting to learn navigation and becoming a oi, an oio, which is a priest. Um, and so, you know, he started and he learnt, and so he knew, he would have known about this, t- you know, this land. So, right. you know, when you start putting those kind of connections together, Tupaya was a really big part, um, big part of the voyage. Coupe yeah. seems to be like this, this, this character yeah. that is like, oh, how much do we know? How do we know? Where, where? Yeah, he's really strong in different areas of um, Aotearoa, so the Hokianga um, up north, really strong um, presence there. Um, and not so much here, but he had a really strong connection here. Um, so, you know. Because we are in Fitianga or Kupe, is the full name of our town, yeah? Yeah, Fitianga and um, Nui a Kupe, absolutely. Nui a Kupe. Yeah, so the crossing place of Kupe. Um, so, you know, I just think. Coupe, and when you when I first started, and I googled Coupe and Fitianga, nothing came up. Oh, thank you. you know, so it is a story that we really do need to tell. So um, you know, and a lot of people are really shocked. That's the one thing when they walk into the museum and they see, apart from the boobies, um, you know, <laughs> on the, <laughs> the on least the, on the hunt statue, you to find. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that always gets our year seven and eight boys. Um, <laughs> apart from that. <laughs> yeah, Apart from that, you know, a lot of people are really shocked to see see Coupe there because, um, A, they've seen the statue down on the Wellington waterfront um, that used to be in the railway, so it's a, it's, it is a copy of that statue, and then they're kind of like, huh, why is he here? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of that. Is it is it something that, um, that it's more recent for museums in Aotearoa to tell both stories like to dig more about maori heritage and 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 history and try to make this this blend so we accept that whatever happened in the past stays there and we have to move forward and move smart or there's still a little bit of resistance of like english story being a bit more present how we navigate that nowadays Mm. um for me navigating it's been really hard um because I didn't feel it was my story to tell, so um, I I didn't feel that I should be telling Natihe stories. That's kind of not where I was. Um, however, I was um, had a chat to somebody in the museum world, and they said, "Well, you know, who else is gonna do that?" Um, so yeah, for me, I I can tell some of the, but they're not personal stories. They're not, you know, but they are some of what has happened um, in Te Whanganui o Hei. So, um, and so now I, I came to peace with putting our taonga back out um, and onto exhibition. It had been off exhibition for a couple of years, partly because we had been cataloguing it and we needed to know what was in our collection. Um, but I felt comfortable um, and knew that I could put it back out appropriately because that, that's for me is to make sure that I've, I've done the taonga right. I've, I've put them back out in place in a in a special place where they you know people can understand and some of our tongue you can um, some of the wooden pieces you can touch you know feel them because they, they they're there to be touched um, I've done some learning recently of brown tonga and the fact that for me you know that they're, they're locked in boxes um, and so next year, as part of the Aotearoa um, New Zealand Histories curriculum, I'd really like to get them out of their boxes um, and have the students really starting to handle and Tonga should be touched. That's their, what they they should be part of um, part of the world. You know, that's what that's what they are. And this is maybe for for both of you. Um, why do you guys think that there was a little of a pushback when the government said that there would be a an increase on the amount of uh, Aotearoa's history to be taught at schools? Balance, I think. I think it's uh, to make sure there was a lot of, to make sure the stories are balanced Um, and not bias, I'd say, yeah. Um, And for me, that's, that's one thing I'm I'm very careful on and I'm doing a lot of learning myself on making sure that I'm not, um, that the stories that I'm telling are balanced. We do have two, we do have two, um, we have a history 
and that history is both European settlers and Māori, and they all have their own stories to tell. And in Te Whanganui o Hei, they actually weave and wind together. Um, so I think, you know, um, but I think that's where the pushback came, would be balance. It's interesting, because um, I, as a teacher, I, I studied whatever I've studied in my life, and a lot of it has not been New Zealand local stories. So it's always been quite intimidating to, you know, to not want to do it wrong. As you say with the Tonga, you, you wanted to be at peace yep. with making sure that you did it justice, you did it appropriately, the norms or the... Um, all the procedures were done properly yep. and that you wouldn't say stuff that's wrong mm. and ha having the uh, professional development with you a couple of years ago you helped me realize um just stuff i didn't know yep. and you know i'd done a field trip um with one of my classes off to lover's rock yep. without knowing the story because i didn't know it yep. and then all of a sudden we had an educational day with you for at least half the day and it was fantastic i learned well i, I won't do that again yep. unless i speak to one two three people and we only go to certain places but it's not there to film horror movie trailers as we were doing. No. Because it was wrong. Yeah. But then now I know that, it makes it a bit more comfortable for me to go, okay, well, now I need to ask the right questions. Where can I go and film horror movie trailers? Yeah. Or if I was to go somewhere in that area, what are the real stories we can actually start to film or to make a film and trailer for a particular story in history? Yeah. Without having this push. Because yeah. I think the, the idea of having balance is wonderful. But balance is going to take a long time, and it ha but it has to have a big push because yeah. it starts. Yeah. I need yeah. heaps of professional development before I ever go, hey, young people that I'm here to influence, I'm going to tell you some stories. I better know it right. Yeah. I better do it right. And I better be comfortable with it as well so that we can start getting creative with ideas and imagination. Yeah. But it all fits in the parameters of being respectful and yeah. right. But again, I can understand some of the pushback being, all right, all teachers have to have half their, half of the units they work on must be local curriculum yeah. and going, oh, great, who's going to help us make sure we do that right? That's what I was going to say. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's so big. Yeah, yeah. And, and yet I, it push for balance. Yeah, and I think that's it. I think that's the other side of it is that, um, you know, the government has set this up so that it is a very much an iwi driven to a point. So iwi are very much involved in the curriculum. But our iwi here is just they're too small to, you know, and they just don't have the time. Um, and they're, they're pulled and pushed from different projects that are going on in the community. Um, and, and it's not just our iwi. There are other iwis in the country that are the same. They're just, they just don't have the capacity. Um, so I think we can step into that role. Um, and, you know, I'm happy if somebody doesn't like what I'm saying or, you know, have ask you know mm. have a chat to me um the when i do do what i do um with the kids um it's very much uh the children are fine with it it's the adults in the room mm. that are the you know even to the point when i was doing tuya and we were talking about captain cook and um i had some flat earthers in the room <laughs> You know, oh, um, and so it's kind of like, come on, guys. So, yeah. Do they use cell phones? <laughs> Amazing. But you know, it's that, and it's and it's that because you know, I say to the kids, you know, we've got a map. You know, it's flat on the wall. Why does the light stop here and the light starts down here? And it, the kids will go, "Oh, Bex, come on, it's round," you know, and then there'll be a comment from a corner, you know, and it's like. Okay, <laughs> move on. Let's move on. Yeah, but um, yeah, it is. It is, and um, so some of the stories with the Aotearoa curriculum, the New Zealand's curriculum coming out, um, we have started that already. We've already begun it. With not flat earthers. Not flat. Sorry, yes, thank oh, you. Sorry, we're moving on. Clarifying that. Getting rid of flat. <laughs> They can go there. Um, so the Mercury <laughs> Bay, yeah. Mercury Bay Area School have really started their curriculum mm. and 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 moving into um, the history. Um, and the junior school in particular, and I've done a lot of work with them in the last term. And um, and some of it, you know, I wasn't even aware of. So I'm doing my own learning at the same time. And so when I do teach that to the students, you know, some of them ask questions, but it's the parents in the room. You just see them mm. kind of <clears throat> sing a little bit or, you yeah. know. Um, but then they'll come up to me after and go, wow, I didn't know that. And they'll ask me a question, and then we have this other adult conversation over top of what the children are learning. So, and to me, that's really cool because I'm not just teaching the students. Mm. 
that their parents are, are learning it as well, which is well, great. Well, well-educated parents will teach I'm the just, kids, I'm right, I'm just Fabian? stuck on flat earthers. Sorry, I'm just, I'm so, I'm just paralyzed by just absurdity. You didn't think they were in New Zealand, eh, bro? Oh, I've, 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 I've met a couple, and uh, but I've never been able to take them seriously in any other part of their lives. Invite them to the that. show. Yeah, yeah. Bex, um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Brazil, Brazil was colonized by the Portuguese and um, there's a lot of stories that they get mixed up because people sometimes uh, glorify or give credit to a lot of settlers who, well, they are part of history, obviously, but uh, sometimes for reasons that were not amazing so yeah. like i made sense of something that really changed my perception a lot of the families who came to brazil like they didn't come like they were kind of forced by the right. portuguese kind of like you gotta go yeah this is the amount of land that you're gonna look after you gotta send this amount of whatever you're taking out of the place back and you have a, a an obligation yeah. to that space how much of that connects to New Zealand? Like how how the the families who came here were treated? What kind of deal uh, happened for populations to start to to happen in these areas? I think colonization is a word that's gonna just keep floating now. Um, and for me, I actually had to do some learning on what colonization was um, and how it happened here in Aotearoa. Um, and so. And there's a lot of my colleagues in the country and museums that have already done that work, which is fantastic because, you know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Shout out. Yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, you've got to remember the one thing, you've got to go back. And I always I say this about Captain Cook as well. 1769 was a very different time. Um, 1800s was a very different time. Um, the 1800s in England was a really different time where people were being pushed out of their land for you know, other richer people coming in and laws were changing and land wasn't the way that, that they were going to be working, they were going to be pushed into factories. And so to do what they, farmers, for instance, to do what they were doing, they had to leave. Um, and Aotearoa was painted as a fantastic place to come. Um, and, you know, there's there's one that there is a, an act that's around called the Wastelands Act. Um, and so what happened is if you were a family in England and you could afford to pay to bring your family out on the ship, you were given land when you got here um, and it was a set, set amount. So I think it was like 10 acres an adult and five acres a child. And, um, and then you got so much for um, something else. So, you know, a family of five could end up with 100 acres. You know, so, um, but it was land that the government of the time deemed as waste because they could see nobody living on it. But that wasn't, you know, there it was some wasteland, um, deemed wasteland in Tairoa even, that was taken from Nasi Hay um, because it was covered in bracken, it was covered in bush, you know, so it, and it wasn't being farmed, you know, so it wasn't profitable. So let's take that land because there's actually nobody living on it in September because, oh, in September, the iwi are all out on the islands looking after their crops. So, you know, that sort of, um, and that happened all over New Zealand. We have one family that came here to um, uh, Pitianga, um, and he came, when they got to Auckland, they had taken that land and um, that option and got to Auckland, and he was told that land was up north, up in Ahipara, which is, you know, really um, quite up the tip, tip of um, New Zealand. Um, and it was in the back blocks of nowhere, covered in scrub. And, you know, and he, here he is, him and his wife and three or four, might have even been five, young children. And he said, well, I'm not taking my children into the middle of nowhere. So he stayed in Auckland, got a job, got himself some money, and then came here and, um, and leased land here. So, you know, I think the settlers didn't have as easy a time as some, you know, they came in and broke land that but was it their land to break mm. uh, you know that's the yeah that's kind of the question for me that's fascinating i, so <laughs> I suppose uh, growing up we learned a lot of like american history through television and media um kids films learning yep. about the types of people that travel to the states i've often seen it painted as we're traveling for riches and glory and adventure and yep. then they say oh, and that's why you get those sorts of people in america yeah 
Whereas, mm. was that a different perspective, those that came here, at it more out of, but again, is it desperation? Or is mm. it a sense of adventure? Yeah. How is it painted, that sort of narrative? Yeah, and I think um, if you come into the museum and we've got a video showing and it's in the dairy area, in our dairy factory area, there's one part of it and then in the agriculture there's another part. And that's actually a 40-minute documentary that was filmed here in New Zealand by an actor and their families at the time. Um, and then that was then sent back to England and it portrayed this magnificent life here in you know New Zealand. You can go and pick oranges in your backyard and you know to make it rain you just turn a tap and you know it's a fantastic place. Well, yeah, but that that land is completely is, is now um, pasture, but it probably wasn't always pasture. So who's come in before them and done that hard work over top of it? So, you know, I think um, they were it was portrayed as the place to come, um, but they were what they were leaving was probably just not as you know it's not good. Yeah. So it's interesting trying to navigate that perspective, the idea of they were forced out of their skilled jobs so they were either going to be impoverished with their families and yeah. die out or choke out or have a horrible living mm. or travel and be given this big opportunity of ridiculous hard work for decades and travel on a boat yeah mm. you know a ship how that's... fast were they well cook's endeavor only went five knots max so if you think about it, i tell the children and anybody who'll listen that's the speed of the ferry yeah. And that's the speed of what you go out when you go out of the river. Um, and that was top speed. So, um, and a, a lady I know, a friend of mine, who actually came on the Endeavour when Tuia 250 and the Endeavour came, the mm -hmm. replica, she was on board and she said at one point we were going negative knots because the the wind was just pushing yeah. pushing them back. So, you know, no wonder it took Cook three years to, <laughs> to get from one side of the world to the other. Um, so yeah, those ships didn't go fast. It was a three-year th trip. His first voyage was three years, yeah. And his his um, his trip back from um, Aotearoa, he, he went from Aotearoa to Australia, um, and from Australia on was horrible, absolutely horrible. They lost men left, right, and centre. Um, I think they had a crew of ninety, and they lost thirty mm. or forty. Mm. Um, so yeah, it wasn't a nice time. I've I've heard from uh, from different um, Maori guests we had mm -hmm. on the show that there's this thing um, with Maori uh, telling stories. Yep. That was not the thing of of writing. No stories. Yep. It, it's always telling and, and and passing stories through generations. Yep. Um, how hard it is, for example, to to study and to make sense of something so important like the treaty. Because for someone like you and for historians, for people who are like, you got to understand what was happening before, you got to make sense of like how the mood was, yeah. what, what vibe was, who was involved with whom, yeah. and how much you actually have from the other, from the Maori side of the story. Yeah, yeah. you've got it. You, you can't, you can't sit here and think, oh, it's 2022. That's how it happened. You, <laughs> you can't, you know, you, you've got to put yourself, you've got to think about who was around, how, um, what circumstances were happening at the time as well like what battles were happening you know um we had at the time of the treaty there was um muskets were coming in you know we were bring the, the and weapons were coming in um but even going back to 1769 with cook he brought glass bottles you know he brought nails um you know there was things on the ship that Māori had never seen before, you know, what is this nail? And it started a difference in tools as well. So, um, you know, and a bottle, <laughs> imagine what you could do with a bottle, you know, you could oh. scrape. Have you seen um, the film, uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy? Yeah, totally. They dropped the, glass, the Coke bottle out the window. Captain Cook oh. probably started that where he dropped a bottle over the side, you know. So um, I think you when, as historians and people like us in museums, um, we really do need to think about when we are telling the story because that's what we do we do we tell stories as well um and you know an object an artifact a tonga is nothing without its story without its people um so we have to think about that and we have to go back through and for me to research i go back different layers and research and then f come forward again and then i might have to go back down that rabbit hole and mm. go back again so um and it is talking to people, it is that corridor, you know, um, and it, it would be really nice if we could have more corridor, you know, yes, yes, but, yes, yes. Um, and pe it's people's, people are busy, so, you know. <laughs> what, what, what moments, um, 
wow, so many things to talk about. <laughs> what 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 things that you can remember now they were like just mind blowing for you? You were like, what? Oh, really? That happened? And then you went because you told us before that you go through th at least three um, sources sources, mm -hmm. and then you you. You establish that that yeah i can pass this on yeah. were there like moments cool moments or like a bit shocking moments in in our history here yeah i think um because my very my very big first kind of education program and and um exhibition that i created was for two 250 so um that 1769 and, and that was quite a hard time for aotearoa um, Can you just tell us what, what that was? Because we have some people watching from oh, overseas okay. that might yeah. not know what yeah, the 2 year okay. 250 so was. So 2 year 250 is, um, was New Zealand's or Aotearoa's commemoration um, for the 250 years of Captain Cook coming to Aotearoa. Um, and for some parts of Aotearoa, it wasn't a good time. And I was going to say, you used the word commemoration, not yeah, celebration. We were, yeah, well, definitely that was one of the things that Wellington um, Ministry of Culture and Heritage said, no, it's not a celebration because not everybody has a celebration mm. um, for us here in Te Whanganui Ohe, Mercury Bay um, it is a little bit of a celebration to a point um, so we were one of the four landing sites in New Zealand so there's only four landing sites that were part of the commemoration um, so we were lucky enough to have the Endeavour replica here um, and so it, it just it looked at 250 years because there was one in two at 200, so um, so that was really important. But it was very European. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so this one was going to be very balanced, and the government kind of um, were, and that's when they came up with the word toya toya 250. Um, so toya is the weaving um, coming together as two peoples. Um, and so the Aotearoa Histories curriculum is kind of following on that really came into play at that time. So so for me, yeah, when I was doing Tuya 250, um, we created, because we were very much a cook-heavy museum when I first started. Um, and my first question when I was in, I think, two weeks into my job, I kind of went, where's the Māori heritage? Like, you know, um, and... Uh, you know, I never really got to the bottom of that answer. So um, 2250 come along and I was like, great, this is time to kind of tell those stories. And we were lucky enough to have um, a couple of authors that were working with Joe Davis on a book at the time called When Tawaka Met Cook, so Chief Tawaka. Um, so we were lucky enough to use some of that content that Joe had, um, Joe Davis had talked to them about. So um, doing that exhibition was really cool. We got to actually put some of that content into the museum, finally. Um, but just the conversations I had with Joe, really, Joe Davis, and one of them was um, we were talking about um, tools and the stones and um, the... Um, the talkie, the ads is, you know, and um, he said, oh, yeah, but Bex, he says, they got glass. And I was like, what? He's like, they got glass. And I was like, glass? He's like, well, Cook had bottles on board. And I went, oh, my God, they did too. <laughs> so, you know, it's like this suddenly, and then I kind of went, oh, and then the nails, like, and I was like, nails? And they're like, yeah, they used to strip the nails out of the boat, you know, to, and the sailors used to trade the nails for certain things. Um, so you talk about this really difficult time getting back from Australia all the way back home. The boat was falling apart. Oh, totally. All the nails. <laughs> totally. <laughs> In Tahiti, they were actually stopped. They weren't allowed to give out nails again from that point on because um, they had given so many out because there was a lot of ladies in Tahiti. Mm. Yeah. Ah, they're getting nailed. <laughs> Trans a transaction. They nailed a transaction. They nailed. Uh, totally. Yep. Um, yeah. Whoops. Yeah. So, but no, it's <laughs> though. <laughs> it was That's good, a really that. hard one to talk to students about. It's like, yeah, why is there no nails in the ship? Um, <laughs> Here at Old Base. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, kids. Um, but yeah, so for me, I think that's kind of where that, that started for me. It's like that. Wow, wow. moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, just that, because I had obviously had my really <clears throat> European head on, and I didn't even think about it from a, from another point of view. So, interesting part that you sort of just alluded to is that, you know, they had bottles then come in and nails come in. But then fast forward 50 years, and then there's Māori history there. Mm. And 50 years later, there's still Māori history. Like, history didn't, it wasn't only Māori people back in history. No. That it's here. 
Yeah. And it always has been. So I suppose just that revelation of, of course, they had some of the integration. To, yeah. Has that built on? Is there more in terms of once all the rest? Because what year will the ships come? You talked earlier before the show that a lot of ships are coming to New Zealand at a certain point, and so, there must be a lot more then weaving of history there. Oh, totally. So 1769 was Cook, obviously, and he was on a scientific voyage looking to see what um, the Admiralty, you know, what resources were around the world. Um, and Joseph Banks was taking plants back to, you know, there's, there's harakeke growing in the Kew Gardens in England, and, and they came from Aotearoa, you know, so he took thousands of plants back with him. Um, so, um, so that was 1769. And then you kind of skip forward a, a little bit to the early 1800s, and that's when they started sending ships out here. The Admiralty were looking for timber. They needed timber. They were at war. They needed ships. They needed spars. Um, they need, you know, the big tall spars. Um, so, you know, they knew that we had that timber down here, and they knew that Australia was, in Australia, is starting to kind of um, grow as well. So the ships started coming. Um, you know, and then 1840, we had the buffalo. Um, so the buffalo had been here a couple of times prior to that. So that, you know, 1835, I mean, it was built in 1813, 14, somewhere around there. So, you know, those ships were starting to kind of come around the world and they weren't missing New Zealand. Like they were coming to Aotearoa. So I think um, we've always had those coming and we've always had the different, like they're bringing the muskets, they're bringing the bottles, they're bringing the tools. Um, then they're, they're bringing people, you know, and they're leaving people here. People were being left mm -hmm. here. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're right, there was that, um, you know, they were, men were coming and they were mar marrying the Māori woman, you know, so. Was there much the other way around out of curiosity? I mean, I've heard that narrative a lot. So the, the men were marrying the young, were the many women marrying the Māori men. Um, I don't know. That's a really fascinating question. I might actually go mm. under a bit of, because all I've ever really seen is the Māori woman, um, um, you know, mar marrying the Europeans. Was, was that sort of a custom, because all through history there's customs of a dowry coming with the woman and it being a somewhat a transaction of relationship, land, power, um, expanding wealth. But the other way around would be quite interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, the idea of a colonising nation coming in to share their wealth with the gen with the dowry coming from the other mm. way. Yeah, no, I haven't actually, oh, I haven't looked at good it from question, that. Yeah. Mr. Ooh, good question, Mr. Robert. Good question, absolutely. Yeah. There you go, so you've been sexist your whole career. <laughs> and now, and now <laughs> we're getting to the root of it. <laughs> when, you, when you started your question, I was wondering if you would ask about Maori leaving Mm -hmm. Aotearoa oh, yes. mm -hmm. with English. That's where I thought you, you were going with it. Yeah, a lot of Māori went offshore. They went on the ships to um, Australia. Um, they went... Um, As slaves or to help? What, what what was the... Or just for different interests? Or? No, um, a lot of the chiefs, some of the chiefs were asked to go to England and, and talk, um, you know, with... Oh, um, oh like high... Like high people yeah, high in the, oh, cool, yeah, cool, cool. So cool. there's members of Iwi here in New Zealand where... Um, their chiefs were asked and, and met with Queen Victoria, you know. So um, there were delegations that went to um, England. So I don't think it was just a one-way ticket. I well, even that's absolutely news to me. That's fascinating. Yes. I'd love to hear some of those stories. Yeah. There could be yeah. full documentaries or and TV then, series <laughs> telling of those. Because that'll be like, you hear those TV series all the time of people meeting each other, travelling, but yeah. it'll be a Kiwi, like, how well, do they do it? I mean, the other thing too is, is you think about like, so 1769 again, Captain Cook wrote a journal every day, like his whole crew wrote a journal every day. So we know from that, you know, European, um, his his view and, and he would actually write down what the Māori were wearing, what, you know, what they were eating, where they were living, you know, that sort of stuff. So it was a real description of the time. Um, and we And that's kind of the first time that our people had ever, you know, um, had been look watched you know and written down um and recorded so the the way they lived um and then so then you go on and so um chief Tawaka um 
no, not Chief Talwalker. Um, the guy with the nail and his nut, his his name's just gone straight out of my head. He actually had a conversation with um somebody from England, a journalist as well, and he recorded what was happening at the time when he was a little boy, seventeen sixty nine, with Captain Cook, and he spoke to this journalist, and they recorded what actually happened, and you know the fact that Cook touched him on the head, and you know so, and that was another time that was recorded of. Māori and how they were living and what was going on here. So there are recordings um, of of that kind of history as well. So um, It'll be fascinating to hear the, the narrative coming back from England through the, the Māori form of, of telling these stories that weave through the stories of picking up the era of when the, the great chiefs or the delegation came back mm-hmm. and communicated their own, you know, this is what the, yeah. the boat people, this is their set up because it would be so yeah. foreign yeah. but I'd love to know how that was described to the local area that'd be amazing yeah well even just down to the fact that they called them goblins you know no like, yeah the, no the Māori called the Europeans goblins because they rode their boats backwards <laughs> <laughs> like you know you you paddle a walker forward you don't row a boat you don't paddle your walker backwards you know and then they get off their walker and there's these pointy shoes like yeah. hello what are, you know so they did they called them goblins <laughs> so i wonder which book or what book was at the time that they learned the word goblin because a goblin i'm assuming oh uh, it would have been some maori equivalent yeah equivalent. yeah yeah and even to the the sh- sails you know they'd never seen sails like that that was mm. material that they'd never seen before yes they w- would have seen sails on the big um double hulled walker you know but that would have been a different material it would have been harakeke or um fibers of some description not the big white flowing mm. bellowing you know um so yeah i think it would have been a crazy time for them mm. but a time that chief Tawaka knew was coming he knew he he knew that there was change coming and he was ready for change when I, when I um when we were talking about Maori going overseas, yep. um, mm-hmm. I, I just hinted slaves, and then I and then I thought, oh, is that is there any time in history? Is there anything in Aotearoa's history that has these moments of like slaves being brought to work in the country for like English people bringing slaves or making slaves? Is there anything that hints to to slavery? Um, this slavery within the Ewes. Um, so for instance, you, um, talked about Lover's Rock. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a really big, um, battle, I suppose you could call it in the Musket Wars, 1832 ish, somewhere around there. Um, and so it was a time where, um, Hongi Heka from Napui up north decided he was going to take his revenge finally um, because his niece and um, two nieces um, were taken by a couple of sailors from up north and brought down here and dumped, um, dumped off and then they disappeared. Um, so Hongi Heka, that was quite a number of years before and he knew he would wait, he would just wait and his revenge would come and his revenge came in the fact that he had muskets. So he came here um, and slaughtered 300 odd people, 400 people. The the reason um, that area is so sacred is in, at Lovers Rock is because the blood, the the water was red. You know, it was just. But the whole, going back to the slaves, what they did is Hongi Heka took hundreds of women that and children from here and took them back up to Napui as well, up to up north. So you know, as second class citizens, or as simply mm-hmm. you're now our property, we own you. Our property. And now you're our wives. Mm. Now you're our children. Yeah, yeah, and that happened quite, quite regularly. Yep. It's interesting to know that um, you know, the bloody histories of you know, all the empires that have ever been. One person upsets this person in some way. All right, we're going to kill all of them. Yeah, and it's, it's. I guess it's universal that humans. Yep. You know, there's a revenge comes big. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too is like um, Te Whanganui, Hey, um, you know, fantastically rich resource. You know this whole area you know we've got the kaimoana we've got the kauri we've got the forests mm. you know um and they we were it was really rich resource so you know we, they were always being attacked nasi hay were always being attacked um and i think after the um the musket that that 1830s i think there was only 30 or 40 people in nasi hay left at the time so you know yeah. um 
So, and that's one of the other reasons why I think these sort of stories need to be out there for everybody to learn as well. So you kind of have an understanding of what happened. What, who who um, was was the the Napo? He's probably one of the the most I'm like sure it was active Napoli. active yeah. like like I don't want to I don't know if the word violent is the way, but like in in a warrior like in a battle yep. kind of like were they probably one of the most like active and a bit like hard? Yeah, I say Napo. It might not have been all of Napo, but it definitely yeah. Hongi Heka. Um, Hongi Heka was really quite a. Um, <laughs> yeah, he was always on the on the rampage. He was always at war. Right. So, yeah. so, so, just sorry if it's like, a, I, I just don't know. Like, no, no, that's um, right. Was was there a connection between like these these chiefs? Like, were they very aware of of the whole the country as a whole, even mm. the south and the north island? Like, yeah. was there a communication? Was there yeah, a totally? So, um, and when Cook was here, um, Chief Tolwaka actually drew the whole of the North Island on the deck ah. of the Endeavour. Now, how did he know that? And it was accurate. It was accurate enough for Cook to then make his charts from. So, you know, they must have they must have known how their country looked. Um, Can I just jump back on that story before? Because the musket wars, you know, clearly mm. the, the British have been or the travellers have been there and this has happened. Where was the white man when this thing was happening in Ngate, were they away or were the settlers that were also taken down in the war or were they just absent because I've never heard of that involving um no I don't I don't um I need to have a look at my timelines in terms of European settlement here um especially here and um I do know that there was Europeans here when the buffalo came so in 1840 um there was definitely europeans here um gordon brown who created the um ferry landing steps the wharf over there so he had a very large building um, boat building area um so i think the 18 around just after the um musk wars or 18 late 1830s i think there was europeans here but not not many <laughs> at the time that um hongi Hika came yeah but he pushed, he pushed, he pushed people, like he pushed all of um, the Thames Iwis um, into the Hareki Plains, into the swamps. He pushed them all down into the Waikato, you know. So he just came in and just pushed all along Tauranga. He pushed them. Um, and so, you know, they stayed in the swamps and they, you know, until they had re realised that it was clear enough to come out. Um, so, yeah, he, he was, <laughs> he was... Not a very nice person. <laughs> Bex, what's the thing with the name Aotearoa? Because some people say that even like there's this big push and we love to say Aotearoa and, and I think like if, if, if it's the right thing to do, yes, sure, mm. let's do it. Mm. But I even heard from some Maori people that, that it's actually specific for an area of the country. And so what's, what's the thing with the words? Well, because you've got to remember, I think that Iwi, we weren't New Zealand. Mm. Like they were individual areas and they had their individual areas so um you know like there's one tribe in the south island so you know and then you think about the north island so um yeah i yeah it, it wasn't new zealand and mm -hmm. um it was only given as a european so aotearoa i'm not sure kind of that was the land of the long white cloud that um coupe's wife kind of yelled out as she you know proclaimed that she saw land so i don't know and that was only one area and, and an actual fact that could have been here mm. you know could have been here i like aotearoa nice mystery I do little too. cliffhanger <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and um one more thing like going back to i i just love these stories of 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 the boats and the bottles and all those things and boxes and then the Europeans, I'm, I'm sure there was like this peak, there was this moment of like, off we go to New Zealand, and then <laughs> boxes coming with all sorts of stuff. A bunch of animals coming uh, to New yes. Zealand, right? Yes, yes, they did, yes. <laughs> Plants as well, like herbs and all, yeah, all sorts totally. of stuff? Yeah, totally, yep. So not only did Joseph Banks take thousands but, sorry. of plants. Who is Joseph Banks oh, and how sorry. important is he? No, no. <laughs> so Sir Joseph Banks, as he mm. became, was the botanist on board the HMB Endeavour. So, but he was actually the bankroll man. So that actually that voyage wouldn't have happened without Sir Joseph Banks. He was multi-million dollar 
Like he was a millionaire of his time. Um, and the ship was actually changed for him to have space on board. Um, so yeah, it's, um, so he, he was a botanist. He came in and he took um, plants, he took animals, but not live animals, um, and samples and what have you back to England. So, But on his whole voyage, so we're talking, they went to Tahiti, they went to South America, they went, came here to New Zealand, they went to Australia, you know, they went to South Africa, they went all around the globe for three years. And he, he left home, left England with empty pots in an empty room, um, and then ended up back home with a full room with pots full of um, plant specimens. Yeah. So, so mm. the other way around, uh, yep. th things <laughs> coming yep. to, to New Zealand. So when the settlers came to make them feel at home, <laughs> they um, brought certain things with them, and some of those things were plants, which we now probably have as weed species, mm. um, and also some animals and birds. Yeah. Which one? Tell to give give us give us some names, some animals. <laughs> There's probably going to be quite here. a few. So, what are some of your most annoyed by? The possum. Yeah. <laughs> um, and some of the birds. So, like your miners, your starlings, um, sparrows, house sparrows, pheasants, um, quails, geese, ducks. I mean, you name anything that's not native was brought here. If it couldn't fly here itself, and most of those birds wouldn't fly here i wouldn't imagine um paradise um, geese maybe canadian geese um but yeah so they were brought over on the ships and they were brought over um in boxes not as food not as food they were fed they were um they had grass and grains and bugs and all sorts on board to feed them and um they had a list of how many birds they had at the beginning of the voyage and how many they had at the end um, and then when they got here, they were taken in. That was the Naturalist Society. So um, the, they were coming in to make it more homely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah everyone wants another possum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not enough annoying birds flying around me right now. Yeah, no, so, um, and, it, and it just made, so when they woke up in the morning, they could hear the thrush singing. Well, they didn't like the night. <laughs> what are these fat birds walking around for? We want flying or flying birds. Yeah, no. So, um, because the other thing too is when Captain Cook, when they were um, anchored off of New Zealand, the dawn chorus of New Zealand at the time was so deafening. They wanted to turn it down, but they were anchored off hundreds of, you know, yards off the shore. I um, mean, it was so deafening, our dawn chorus. You don't get that here now. No. I think Tiri Tiri Mātangi is about the only place, really locally. Some of our islands out here, um, which are pest-free, um, they do have a beautiful dawn chorus, um, but not our mainland. And um, so, yeah, <laughs> then they brought, so, you know, Europeans brought in that stuff that stopped our dawn chorus. Yeah. What What were the main things, I know, like Kauri and all this stuff, but, like, what was taken from Aotearoa? Like, what What were the, the, the most valuable... <laughs> items or resources that um, were taken from, from Aotearoa? Definitely the wood, timber. Um, we had um, Cody gum, so the gum was taken, um, exported. Um, what else was taken? Yeah, gold, I suppose. They would do that, did that in certain places. Um, but for us here, especially here, um, the Cody was the big... Cody. And yeah, um, certain trees, so like the tōtara and the rimu, were also could also be taken, but um, the iwi marked the trees that they wanted, um, so they weren't touched. Um, and there was also kauri that was in the forest that were called the kings, um, and they were marked and they weren't to be touched either. So um, they didn't kind of touch some of our giants. Um, but so, so that was that was on the treaty. That was that was like was that a local agreement? It was a local agreement with sawmills. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, excuse again. Excuse my ignorance about <laughs> New Zealand history, but like, how long from the moment that Cook arrived to to the, the the signing of the the treaty? 1840 was the signing of the treaty. So February 6th, 1840, um, was the main treaty signing in um, Bay of Islands. Seven so years? 1769. So we're talking 71 years. Yeah. And you've got to remember that a hundred years prior to Cook, we had um, um, the Dutchman, what's his name? 
Abel Tasman. Oh, Tasman. Oh, Tasman. Oh, Tasman. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, Tasman. yeah. So you know, every hundred years we kind of had this group. Yeah, but it's fascinating. Like, all of this is so interesting. Mm. Like the amount of things that were killed, the amount of things that were brought and just taken. Mm. It, it just seems odd to go. Yeah, we like this place, so we're going to take all of this yeah. away from you. Yeah, and we don't like your your morning uh, your dawn chorus, which is quite no. a cool description. No, we don't like your dawn chorus. We're going to create our own, but in that sense, they've just really mixed ours up. They've done a really suppose, bad DJ. Of them. Mm, <laughs> but then I suppose I imagine there's a history of the UK. Well, they have probably destroyed. You know, all those big cities, mm. do they have a chorus that's not honking horns and no. buses and people groaning because they still live there? Yeah. In no, the cloudy skies? Exactly. Yeah, same thing. So they wanted They're everyone to be as miserable as each other. Yeah, probably. Mm. But I, it was more about that they just wanted New Zealand to feel like the home they'd come from. Is there a documented period of time of, because for me it would be, it'd be an entertaining exhibition to go through all of the stuff ups, um, <laughs> completely like as told, like, and they brought the possums. All right, now here's what happened, and yeah. then stoats or rabbits or like uh, they wanted gorse and like, just all these ridiculous yeah. narratives that bringing yeah. things in and how that went wrong. Yeah, it's like the willows, the willow uh, trees bring, yeah. being brought in because you know they looked lovely and that was mm. you know, um, and the poplar trees, you know, they're good fencing, good hedging. Um, the privet trees, you mm. know, great, great hedging. Not good for my allergies. Not good for anybody's allergies. <laughs> so, you know, they, there is a lot that have been brought here that w they could take home now, please. <laughs> because they, cause there'd be a great sort of narrative because they brought rabbits. Yes. Am I right for hunting? Well, for shooting, for a sport? Because were the um, animals brought over just for shooting? Yeah, deer. And then... But then Deer there were other animals goats. they wanted to get rid of, right? So they brought stuff and like, no, that's a bad idea. It's ruining stuff. So yep. they brought in more animals to get rid of them. And then they go, oh, shit, that didn't work either. Mm. So they someone go, you know what? Let's just continue. Let's find another animal <laughs> yeah. and find another. And just think, oh. Well, it's like the big, um, the tar and the um, chamois and the deer and those big, big. What are the tar? Sorry, I didn't know tar. tar. So tar are like um, a deer, almost look like a deer with a really short point to um, horns on them and they're down in the South Island and they were brought here for the um, hunting um, and so now they're in our, in our high country and you know we now have to deal with them because they're a pest like the deer are. Um, same with the chamois you know that's another one that. Is that the idea they strip all the trees? around them, all the yeah, lower levels they just yeah and they just root the ground up and just make an absolute mess so you know um th those animals are all brought in for um pleasure for hunting so you know and they've just ruined our landscape are, are there any animals that have been brought into any other place that have not been a pest to people because like our water mm. systems right now all of our agriculture which is a billion dollar booming thing that you put new zealand on the map is you know there's downstream Sheep. there's literally downstream effects of that yeah um that are quite disgusting mm. but i'm just trying to think of any solution where you know what we need we need some of what they have put here and whether it's ever gone well that was genius apart from cell phone mm. towers because <laughs> we all need more cell phones <laughs> and they're right kids wow <laughs> better public transport system they have a pretty good one don't they mm. in the underground yeah <laughs> that's pretty good. It's, really, it's actually really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um they did. They definitely, you know, our, and we wouldn't have the agriculture <clears throat> um that we have today without the sheep and the cows and you know. Also wonder the idea of at what point in history or at what point in time do we simply go stuff it, it's their country now too. They've been here for, you know, 60, 80 generations of animalhood. Yeah. It's their country too, so now we have to look after and protect them as well. Because at what point does a, a society, a species, or a how mm. many generations does anything have to be somewhere that it thrives? Yep. Because we say it's a pest, right? Mm. But that's our classification of something that's thriving better than what we have. Really, you go, you could say from a completely different narrative, damn, those possums are brilliant. Look at look what they've done. They they have thrived. Yeah. They've Ooh. destroyed. Like they have destroyed. They're those like other humans. Animals. They're as good as us. Yeah, they're like, as yeah. good as humans. So, exactly. Like they're they're amazing like us. Or going, yeah. you know what, those trees have absolutely like privet. 
Well oh, done. You yeah. are pissing off so many people. That's a success story from a different angle. Yeah. Well, I think trout. Look at trout. Trout weren't here. They were introduced for the fishing How as well. How do you get trout alive over uh, here? Pass. Yeah. How do you get fish? <laughs> That's a quiz question. There you yeah, go. Yeah, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and tanks, and they just fed them just, pellets. Just oh, big tanks know. going at five knots, sloshing yeah. around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because and so because trout, um, we now have you can only um, fish so many in a certain time of year. You know, so um, that's a it's a way of keeping the population down, but b it's also protecting the population to a point, I suppose. Yeah, so there are, I would imagine there are some species that we do have in Aotearoa now that we've kind of taken on our own, on our own, and um, we are protecting them. Um, so, but we, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting concept. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's good. I like that's, that's, I like this conversation. that's good. Max, um, I want I want to take a little turn. I, I'm I'm just I'm fascinated about the the treaty because for me it feels like it shaped a lot of of what. It is the country that we live now. And I love that concept when people say 1800s, it's like two people ago. You know, like I know that it sounds funny, but it's like two, three people ago. Like it's not that long ago. No, yeah. Right? Um, and you would have to be very naive to say like that there's no social differences still that you can have a look behind and see that the people who were here before they did not operate in the way that it was expected for the ones who got here. Yeah. So for me, it feels like the treaty, the agreements, whatever you want to call it, um, tried to, to, to make peace, but in a way that it didn't favor the lifestyle of the people who were here before. And by talking to Mike Bennett and all these beautiful Maori teachers who I work with, they always talk about what happened just after the thing with like, Oh, if you have this amount of animals, you have to pay mm. for this amount of, mm. you know, like this money. Or if your land is this big, it means that you have these properties. And then suddenly it's like, what do you mean by size? What do you mean by animals? These animals are just there, mm. and, but suddenly they become your property. So like, how, how much of that do we have documented? Like, is it something that is solid and like, there's a lot of... Yeah, so that word ownership, you know, like they, they just land was theirs that they didn't there was no ownership as such um i think um for for me when i was looking at um at Fitianga and how it kind of grew and the land before and how the land before was used and then looking at the um the native land courts and because for me i've got to learn all of this as well um and then learning the you know, the 10 person thing. So a piece of land that was um, owned owned by Iwi might have had three, 200, 300 people that, you know, had interest in that land. That was their, their land. Um, and then all of a sudden the government's gone, oh no, actually you can only have 10 people listed. So now you have to choose 10 out of those that are actually going to own the I mean, land. I imagine that's a very easy conversation to have. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and then it's like, so then that those 10 people then have say on what happens on that land and who, but then you might only get one or two of them who say, well, actually, I'm going to sell it. So they, oh, I can get money. Somebody's offered me money. I'll take. And so we, but the other nine and even more have no idea that that's happened, you know? And so, yeah, I just... It's that all so that stuff is. So they played on the human condition, yeah. divide and conquer, and mm, yeah, and lease. Lease was another one that kind of they started leasing their land. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it, um, but if you know, if one person has the say and they're getting the money, and they don't tell anybody else, then what happens? You know, so they have that. There's that conflict within themselves as well. Yeah. But the, there was a lot that happened around the treaty um, that, you know, the time, once again, the time was different and things were happening within the Iwis themselves at the time as well. And I imagine so. even communication of changes. Oh, you, absolutely. You don't get a bing on your phone as a notification. <laughs> yeah, your no. land was just sold for yeah, money, yeah. bro. Sorry. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then the Native Land Court came in, which was, is, 
you know, it's, it's another part of our history that's probably a little bit, you know, because then it's the land court, um, they were held in Thames, for instance. So if you had land that was going to be put on the agenda for that day, you had to travel from here to Thames. You can't just hop in your car and drive for an hour, you know, and then you had to get all of your 10 people together and you all had to be there and you all had to go over and um, you had to pay for accommodation, you know, somewhere to stay if you didn't have Fano over there, you had to pay for your food and, you know, so those were costs that people of the time just, they couldn't afford those costs so they didn't go. So then their land was t given to somebody else, you know, or leased to somebody else, or their 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 voice wasn't heard at that time. So the one narrative took control. So So the idea that how much of it is ignorance of cultural customs versus just overlooking like surely it's like are people sitting there going with some sense of well meaning, you yeah, were gonna have a court. Oh, can't they just bloody get here? Come on, what, what's taking them so long? Yeah. You know, I, I've done this a hundred times back yeah. home. Well, I read there was one um, court that was held in Coromandel and there was about seven or eight properties that were actually on it from Mercury Bay. And it says in the court readings that they were really pissed off because nobody from Mercury Bay turned up to do their land court thing. And it's like, well, hang on. <laughs> How are they going to get there? You know, so... Um, I think they were just kind of thinking, oh, well, they're going to travel. Are they just, yeah, a, a, yeah. a product of the time. They're yeah. ignorant of the customs of the place they've come to. Yeah, yep. Mm. Leo likes to talk about um, higher powers, you know, one person in control uh, or a series of people that connect all the dots to do things on purpose. Well, I don't like it. I feel like I have Leo to. Leo likes to talk about um, the reality of the world and the conspiracy. So I wish I didn't have to. Could there be... <laughs> Leo. <gasps> that was a new one. Um, could there be a conspiracy or a story of one person completely set this up going, well, this is going to stuff everyone over because they had a really good understanding of their customs and they knew it wasn't going to work. And they're just like, <laughs> let's see how this one goes. I'm well, going back to Tahiti. Yeah, certainly people in the... Bag of nails. Apparently there were certainly people in the government at the time that were like, I mean, Governor Gray for a start, you know. Um... <laughs> G-R-E-Y? I think so. So that's a Grey Street. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he mm. he did, you know, he made them for instance in Pukakoi, he made them leave their land. Like if you don't leave your land and go to Wakaro, I'm gonna come in and I'm going to make you leave. You know, so he was a really nasty um Englishman, you know, that came in. So I think, you know, there's certainly pockets of people like that who were put into um into Positions, um, of, positions power. of power, um, and they did have power, um, and you know, and then we get acts like the um, Tohunga Act, you know, where you weren't allowed to be a, um, a priest or you you weren't allowed to do any of your your customs, you know, um, because that was not allowed. You, you know, you've got to be like us now. So is this Victoria at the time, Queen Victoria, sitting there, you know? Put, tapping your fingertips <laughs> together going <laughs> and while that's happening in New Zealand where else can I connive yeah maybe maybe mm. yeah maybe it was not her specifically maybe it was the layers below her and you know you just never know was she a puppet <clears throat> wow oh. well the, it, it, it's the thing as you said like it's the thing with power right like it, mm. it, it's part of like the world history like big empires so imagine these people in the 1800s reading about the 1300s about mm. all these empires, about like how was the, the name of the Mongolian one? Uh, Genghis Khan, yeah. the conquering the yeah. whole world pretty much. And then imagine them like, whoa, so that's what we have to do. Mm. So it's just yeah. power well, and the money, money and the power. He just passed away, didn't he? He did pass away. Well, you know, and the Vikings. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, hello. But you're right, we are a very young nation, very young nation. So, you know, I think um, a lot, and a lot has happened in our little time. That links me to something. I've got two questions for you. One, okay. I want to ask you, but ask you to answer it after the second question, just to mix it up. Oh, so I'm going to ask you, where did you just get him from? The question, so, so I'm going to ask a question, <laughs> but then before you answer it, <laughs> so the, the question I want you to answer <laughs> afterwards would be history is not just the thing of the past. It's going to happen, and events right now are history. Yep. So wanted to know your forward projections on what now would be looked back on, like what now makes an exhibit in 50 years. But before <laughs> I ask that question, so you can have time to ruminate, 
How did you become a historian? Is that the term we use or a, oh. just a museum curator? Where did you get an interest Good. in this at all? Because we've started from the museum. Now I get it. Take you us back in time. <laughs> you are a smart man. Okay, so I've been at the museum six years, only six years, it's, mm-hmm. although it feels way longer than six years. Um, I haven't been, I haven't done anything like this before. Um, okay. No, wow. um, my first job was at like at a hospital. So being in the PA typist kind of computer um, IT kind of area, and then went to Middlemore Hospital. Sorry, sorry, I got to go back. How many words could you type per minute? Were you 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 would have been test on that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. On your CV, like, do you remember any how many words per minute? Over a hundred. Oh. Yeah, I was a medical typist as well, so you have to listen and type, and you had to know the lingo, and yeah, so. That's fascinating. And you had to listen to doctors, and they, you think their handwriting is mad. <laughs> <laughs> you should listen to them. Um, and then, so then I went from there. Oh, no, um, don't go from there. That's so fascinating. <laughs> There's so much there. No, no, no. How long were you a typist no. with doing the um, medical? Oh, about two or three years, yeah. yeah. And so with that type, is that that, are they putting notes into a dictaphone and yep. just sending it through, are they putting it down a tube? No, or little tape. Just little tapes, little so you're in a room tapes. with tapes, wow. and then are you At just time, transcribing? Or are you yeah, sending yeah. stuff to be prescribed by No, others? no, no, he, we listen and we type what they're telling us, and then it gets formatted into a letter, and then it goes to them for checking, and then they sign it and send it back. But at the time, the new um, voice recognition dragon system was out, and was just coming out, so they could actually talk um, and the doctor I worked for at Waikato he was pioneering it and he could talk into his and it would type it onto the screen like and so wow. but the typist would sit there and just listen just to make sure because it was very new technology I've heard so, some horror stories about that yeah it wasn't great it didn't last long yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um and then so from there I you're, went, you're, yeah, you're yeah, allowed yeah. to go to Middlemore now okay I'm allowed Texas to go. counties yeah so um I went to Middlemore hospital and worked as a PA there for three years I think three four no I'm not even five I do a five-year thing it's interesting. You're less sure of your own history. Yeah, Please don't go. Please yeah, don't yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, no. Don't go. I know. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm at six years. Oh, no. Um, yeah, and then I went off and had children. And um, when when I had three under two, um, three children under two, that was kind of a bit scary. And then um, went to kindergarten, um, became an administrator at a kindergarten, but also a relief teacher as well. So a, um, what they call an um, unregistered teacher so I could teach with so you pay like a dollar a week <laughs> maybe much. paid in cookies or yeah, yeah. leftover fruit yeah <laughs> yeah um and so then and we decided that was we were living in Waiuku at the time and we decided that we wanted to change and um we loved the side because we've got friends that live over here so um we just made a decision one I think it was about new year's somewhere around there and we went we're moving so we picked the kids up and moved over to here. So And then um, I needed a job and the museum were advertising for an administrator at the time. So I took on the administration role and then fell very quickly into um, doing the other history st- sort of stuff. Were you yeah. always the inquisitive type? Yeah. You know, outside of type, were you reading books on? Yeah. What, so did you have a... Yeah. I think history come from my grandfather, mm-hmm. um, who was a World War II prisoner of war, and so listening to his stories um, really fascinated me because he didn't tell them very often. So you know, so in learning about that um, really um, was really interesting, and learning about my family history and listening to the stories, and and um, I'm very good at when people tell me stuff, I tend to store it away somewhere and it'll just kind of come out at some point so do you call it your mind palace or your warehouse um yeah, it's how, do you, how do you imagine it junk shop <laughs> <laughs> There's a mannequin somewhere. Underneath, yeah. the, underneath the wig, I think there's something to do with the crusades yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um so i i love i love just listening and and um i'm very logical as well like i'm really logical in my thinking so um if I can, like with family trees and, and how people link and events that link and why did this happen and why. So that kind of helps as well. So, um, and I'm kind of crafty as well in terms You're very of. Very modest. <laughs> I have a very good team. Um, <laughs> crafty? How so with crafts? How does that come um, I used into it? to do scrapbooking and 
hard making, although I don't have time anymore to do that. So that kind of layout sort of mm. stuff um, comes into in really handy with um, exhibitions, although now I have an absolutely fantastic graphic designer who does all my work for me. I just provide her the the content and she does amazing whiz-bang things with it. Um, whiz-bang? Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just, and I just really love, and I love the f- working every day that I, it's something different every day something different there's different people walking in the door different conversations different families to talk about different, different events events, events different to talk events. about yeah and um and i just love that i love being able to and inspire people and people and if somebody can take away a fact or an event that i've told them and they can go and tell another person and that person then you can go and tell somebody else then i've done my job so you like the power of knowledge and you like to be the well, knowledge is power. Yeah. <laughs> knowledge is right. power, More. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the first question. Oh, yeah. yeah what was so, that? so <laughs> what's happening now, or what happened <laughs> five, ten years ago, that do you think? I oh, know COVID will be a. Oh a, yeah. A, it'll be a, a little mm. scrap like a post-it note. It mm. won't be that important. So, what would make in or oh, what are we going in two thousand and fifty? What are we going to look back in the turn of this millennia that you think are the most significant things to go back on for future education? What tours are you going to be looking back on going, oh, I could run that better if I hadn't retired? Um, I think we're going to have a real problem. Ooh. And part of that is because right now I could do an exhibition on the 1800s and the early 1900s, no problem. Like Mm -hmm. down pat, got everything, looks great, all the information. From about the 18, um, 18... 1950s onwards maybe we have nothing and i don't and i think it's we have little bits Is but we don't even have or? yeah we don't have photos like from the 1960s 1970s on we don't have that sort of stuff and i don't know whether it's because grandma hasn't Does passed it, yeah. away That's yet what i was thinking it's yeah. just doing the closets the, the, but they having come said on. that what a so you know if your grandmother dies, what are you going to do with everything? Skip. Op exactly. Shop. Op shop. Exactly. Are you going to think about the museum? No. Right. D- d- <laughs> does the op shop think about the museum? Yeah, we, we do. <laughs> we have, Shout we out have, to the op shop. We have volunteers in um, actually all three op shops yeah, in yeah, town. Yeah, people in places. We have people in places. And if we need... Detective. Yeah. If we need Parts objects... Of web. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I'm about to, I'm in the process of creating, we have a local story space in which um, rotates every four months-ish. Um, and we're about to do um, one in there on home technology um, and how it's changed kind of over the years. So, you know, we found a Morse code machine. And, cool. Um, but I had to raid my daughter's um, drawers for their MP3 and MP4 players. And we we are lucky to have one Walkman. You know, but we don't have the old TV. Yes, we've got a new TV because I've suddenly gone, everybody, if you break an appliance, it goes into the collection. Like I broke my coffee machine in the weekend. I'm like, girls, can we put that in the collection? They're like, no. I'm like, why not? Because, <laughs> you know, will be history. this will be history. And we don't have enough. We have nothing from the 80s, unless you bring me your Furby. But <laughs> yeah, it's been about six months where I still have a Furby. And but like, I'm even looking head. over there, like Mr. Potato Head, like, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Get it off the show. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's going to be, um, and I think a lot of the bigger museums are starting to do that modern collecting, um, that to tell the stories of today in terms of things like fashion as well because you know all the clothes that you don't wear anymore either go in the bin bin or to Mm -hmm. the op shop um yeah um i went to the op shop and brought some tupperware (laughs) because you know tupperware's gone so i think i still use tupperware we've got tupperware tupperware we we do yeah it's good yeah so you know and i think sorry sistema what do you mean go good um, going, it's in, gone. In terms of, you know, the Sistema, you know, the click the lids, lunch boxes, but the Tupperware, they sealed tight. They were good. It's plastic. Yeah. Yeah, but it's plastic that you can still use 40 yeah. years down the line. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's okay, not a packet yeah. of chips. But we're not going to waste yeah, yeah. Ben's <laughs> presence to talk about plastic. It's but fine. yeah, and I think from a photo point of view, everything's mm. 
digital. digital. Yeah. So, you know, um, and we don't have the capacity right now yeah. to hold those and we don't know how to do that. We need to be we need to learn ourselves how to how to start creating a digital collection. Um, but we need the technology to be able to do that, which we don't have and our systems aren't there and you know, so mm. um but yeah, we are gonna have this massive I'm not gonna be able to do an exhibition even in twenty years time. You know, like you just wouldn't be out. We wouldn't be able to do it. We'd be scratching our heads and raiding everybody's cupboards. It's pretty crazy how, um, like, so many of these items that you mentioned, like twenty years ago, you wouldn't imagine that they would be antique. You like, like your rare <laughs> things. You know, like um, history is just going so yep. fast that yep. the MP3 player that it was the coolest thing eight years ago. Now it's just like, whoa, that's so old, man. I've Look at that. I've still got my uh, iPod 80 gig with the little circle button on it. It Does still it goes. It goes, but I will never plug it into a computer because yeah. it'll just be like, update, just, delete, gone, yeah. ruined. So I have to charge it into a wall. But every time I, the cable breaks, I have to find another one. I'm just, if I plug mm. it in, is it going to break? There's a little mm. split in the screen, but it still yeah. goes. Because you think about <laughs> what is in a cell phone. Like what? What is in a cell phone now that you used to use that is mm. no longer there? I've heard a comedian talk about this. You know, <laughs> if we, if, like who, who, who would have thought about you know thirty years ago? You wouldn't go. Look, I'm going to go out to the shop, but before I leave, I need every photo I've ever taken. And they grab all their photo albums. Or you know what I want? I want to have um. Where, where's that diary with all the people I've ever known? I want a picture mm. of every person, all their contact, your address book. Yep. Uh, I want every DVD I've ever liked. You grab your whole DVD collection, shove it in the car with you as you go out. Yep. That's the idea. Or I want every book ever written. I yep. want the dictionary. I want yep. the map. Does it worry you, Bex, that like because <laughs> the way that sometimes you find a document and it's a piece of paper, mm. does it worry you that this massive security that we talk about so much now is not that massive because we're talking about countries ruin it the cable connections under the sea and suddenly your cloud mm. is actually not a cloud it was a cable under the sea yeah, that someone totally. ruined it and your cloud is gone so mm. do you think we're going to lose a lot of beautiful memories because we're not thinking about a an alternative way of storing things or we're trusting too much in well, technology to be i mean if you're doing family if you're sitting at home now and you're going i'm going to go and research my family history five percent of your family history is online 95% of it's probably in a regional museum like mine, ours, you know? So um, that history that we have here, you can't get that anywhere else. You have to come, you have to, you know, it's paper. It's paper, <laughs> it's not yeah. in a cloud. Um, and I think, you know, um, unless that information that people are putting in the cloud, is putting in the cloud, if it doesn't come down to us, who's to say in 40 years time, we're not got, we're, we won't use the cloud, we'll go back to pen and paper. I don't know. None of us know. So, you know, then there's this shift and we, we've lost, like, you know, newspapers. We don't have, we don't keep newspapers anymore. Um, whereas we've Except got... to wrap up glass. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Or oh, something horrible. Start a fire. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, and we've got, we've got newspapers from the 1800s, late 1800s, you know, that are still tangible. You can touch it. You can read it. You can see what life was like. Can you do that other than looking at a screen to I know that um, the local informer the local <laughs> Sorry, informer I can deep. I can go back <laughs> so many months because I wanted to go back to find something the informer and I went back online but it only goes back so far um yeah be because when the new owners took over their links broke oh mm. so I, was good. I, was to, I was trying to find some articles because there was this huge thing like we've got all these newspapers in the museum okay and to actually store a museum um, <clears throat> well you've seen our upstairs mm -hmm. to actually store a newspaper correctly it has to be humidly controlled it has to have tissue each in in each layer it has to be wrapped it has to be you know nobody touch it it, it has to be stored correctly to last however long so then, okay, we'll digitise it. So Papers Past, which is a fabulous website, if you're ever doing family history or wanting to look at history of New Zealand, you go onto Papers Past, and there's all the, the papers are digitised. So can we throw out the papers that have been digitised? And yes. No. 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 What happens if the internet breaks? <laughs> 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 
See, but that's and there's 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 two groups in the museum and the archive field that are like that. Are like, if oh, you digitize it, you biff it, you know. But I'm like, oh, but what happens if we need something and it's not on the internet and I have to go looking for it? No, I haven't looked at anything for like six years because I do use the internet. But one day there may not be. And we have to go to that paper. So if you are a hoarder and your family <laughs> gives you shit, listen to this show again and you have a lot of cool arguments. To be <laughs> Now, if you are a hoarder and your family gives you lots of shit, improve your life stopping a hoarder and give it to the professional yeah. hoarders. Or start a museum, yes. right? Or, or <laughs> yeah. Start giving tours, vacuum, um, open ring, some windows. Ring us first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Meg, so let's 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 talk about some 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 cool things that people can do to support and maintain yep. our history. Mm -hmm. What's the best thing when you find that box at grandma's house and there's a bunch of stuff? Do you look for your local museum? Do you yep. take to like are there procedures that, that help that to be like Yeah, so we, we in museums we talk about this thing called provenance. So it's um where a piece, where an artifact, where Tonga, where something belongs, where it's come from. Um so one of the questions we would ask is if you brought something to us, we'd go, Okay, what's its provenance, what's its link to to us here in Mercury Bay? Um because if it links to Coromandel Museum, for instance, then they're the best people to take care of it be their kaitiaki so that's one of the questions and and don't be offended if we ask that because it's just you know um that's just how museums roll we don't we like to share and things go back to where they are supposed to be so um but yeah definitely give us a call come in and see us bring the box in leave it with us for a little bit we'll have a look through it and say no it's you know not so good or mm. yeah it's great we're going to take the whole lot and we'll put it away but the other thing is don't be offended on the other hand mm. if you come mm. back in in three months time and you don't see it on display because only five percent of our collection is actually on display what came to you in a <laughs> box full of random stuff that you just couldn't believe that was there you was like wow this is wow this is gold look at this not gold but oh, yeah um there Imagine was, it was one yeah hey yeah um we got one recently Oh, um, from a family and it was um, slides of their trips around the world and just seeing other, you know, their their family moments, you mm. know, as they, as, and we couldn't look at them properly on a proper slide thing. We're just looking, you know. Um, Sorry, what, what do you mean by slide? Do you mean like a, not a reel? No, the little, you know, the little photo slides that you put into a machine. put that into you could turn it. around. <laughs> wow. No, no, not the Viewmaster. No. Just a, a lot, that square, square slot. Oh, oh you put the goodness. machine and you can, oh, like, like, a, a, on, on like a carousel, carousel and you, it's like a projector and you project like them projector, onto yeah. this and then you just click the button and it goes through and it's like makes a movie out of your photos. Wow. Yeah. When was that technology? Oh. 80s, maybe? No, even earlier than that. 50s, 60s? Oh, that's, that's, that's wow. way back, somewhere, that's Yeah, yeah, because these photos are from got to be the 60s 70s but in this box was an amazing um talkie as well and ads um and it's actually from the tequity area um but it was, we, i talk about provenance but it was just too beautiful we had to put it on display here um in our tonga because um they when people bring us stuff they just want us to look after they want mm. to hand over they want somebody else to look after that and um this lady had been looking after this for the gentleman who passed away and so she said look i just want you guys to to look after it so we took it and um we're we're, we're kaitiaki yeah nice. and i suppose that's it we're guardians of history for oh. sure yeah Bex, tell us a little bit more about mm. cool events, things that are happening, Ooh. how to support the museum, how much does it cost, where where is the museum? Yeah. So the museum costs like less than a cup of coffee to get into as an adult. Yeah, if you're Coffee's an adult. getting more expensive. Exactly, you can, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So five bucks an adult um, and children 14 and under are free. So, um, you know, Nana and Grandad can bring the grandies for a tour through the museum. Um, and then um, if you want to, you can become a friend of the museum. We have a Friends of the Museum um sponsorship um membership so if you're having membership um it's free entry to the museum all year so um and then you also get to come along to our events and um um what else do we do well, you're doing, openings and you're doing something this um friday right Ooh, Ooh, it's, one of my, so it's one, of, exciting. one of my favorite times of the year exciting and terrified all in one 
Yeah. Um, so we normally do a night at the museum and it's normally a really family friendly affair where the children get to come through the museum with their torches. So the museum lights are completely off. So the place is dark. Sounds and, delightful. Oh yeah. And they get to go through the museum with their torch. I normally give them a quiz today because it's about learning as well as you go through the museum as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so th this year we have decided to shake it up a little bit. We need a few more visitors to the museum. So mm. we're really pushing. We really would like some support from our community. Um, and supporting our community is also about collaborating with our community. So I had heard from a little birdie that um, our Halloween HQ is not going to be um, put in place this year for Halloween, which is the Cook Drive house with mm. Eloise. Um, so I approached Eloise and said, hey, I've got a really big building. Would you like to put your <laughs> Halloween HQ in there? And she said, oh, yes. Amazing. Yeah. So um, we're gonna, on Friday night, we're going to start off at 5.30 with our fun, our friendly night um, with the torches. Um, and that's from 5.30 to 7. And then from 8 o'clock to 9.30, we are going to be a scare house. So we're calling it After Dark. Um, mm. And do you dare, can you make it through the museum? Probably not, no. no. I, uh, <laughs> Can you make weak, it in the front door? Uh, I don't know, weak constitution, weak bladder. It's not going to be a good night for anyone. I'm Small staying. town reputation. <clears throat> I'm oh. staying at the front, don't worry. <laughs> Great. But yeah, so it's only um, $5 um, a person for the fun, our friendly one. And because we're scaring the bejesus out of you, we need to charge you more. So it's $7 for the um, after dark. But all of the funds that we... Um, that we fund, we're fundraising for the museum to keep the museum going so that we can continue being guardians of the history. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Sounds terrifying. Sounds terrifying. It does. You, you actually, introducing that is, is <laughs> introducing that is, is really great and fascinating, but I'm still stuck here after you talked about. Oh, we're going back to flat. No, 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 not oh. flat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, <laughs> Just last the idea question, of Robert, people do holding on to things. Mm. And I'm just going through my own house now going, what do I have that tells a story? Children. You know, thank you. Uh, You're what, welcome. what objects that um, have I acquired just or give inherited? Give them away into the music. Sorry. <laughs> what, object, like, what do I have? Uh, as in, do I lack history or relevance if I don't have many things? Or what's my value to the community? Like, I'm just... Philosophically oh, speaking, it's it's a strange mm. place to think of. What do I have that's going to be worth something or is worth something, but I haven't thought about it in that way? Because mm. well, we're, mm, we're very much a use, throw away, we just buy because we can afford. Because I've got these of. little plant stands. I, I'm here to just recently, my, both my grandparents passed away, one end of last year, yep. one beginning of this year, my grandmother's. Um, and I've got these little plant stands, circular, ornate things, mm -hmm. beautiful carved wood, yep. it, you know, Goldilocks story, small, uh, middle and large. Yep. And I've just heard from my cousin who lives in town here, Tina, that um, they belong to Popper, but not the Popper I know, another Popper, an older Popper. Yeah. So I now now I need to find out that story. Like, yeah. so they're older than I thought. They're, yeah. they're another generation or two upwards. Yeah. And you're just your thought, just your the fact that it takes you back to that place. So um, a photograph of, so if you find going through it, like, you know, is there a photograph of the lounge with those three pieces in it, mm. you know, and it takes you back to that place. I think that's the story as much as, you know, um, see for me, one of my, um, going into my grandparents' house, um, the smell for a start, mm. um, but the phone, you know, the old phone, and we had to, yes, <laughs> yes. you know, um, and I think, that kind of makes you think. So every time I see a phone like that, I, it's taking me back. Um, and I think our, even today, like a toy that um, I gave away all my Barbies when I was 17, um, and now I have a Barbie mad daughter, you know. It was a wise decision at the time. <laughs> I mean, well, socially, I think you needed to. But now, <laughs> now I won't give away any of my children's toys, which drives my husband nuts. Um, but for me, I remember them playing with that, mm. you know, and we've got photos of them <clears throat> being given that for Christmas. And so those photos that go with that story... Um, you know, that will, in 30 mm. years' time, that's what will make that object tangible yeah. and 
and part and museum worthy mm. you know it's uh, those memories and that story that goes with it it's funny what you're saying because i love the idea of detachments of letting go of things and my parents went from <clears throat> a big house to a tiny apartment not yep. that long ago and my sister had to do the work of putting things into boxes and selling and, and giving mm -hmm. them a, and it got to a point that my mom said i i don't even want to see it i don't even yeah. want to see you doing it yeah. because it was painful hard and for me it was like oh come on just let it go and then and then my sister started sending pictures for me like because they had a little bit of room for a little bit of my things you know and then she was like yeah. oh do you want to keep this do you want to keep that yeah. and then I was like, nah, it's fine. I've been here for almost 10 years. I don't even remember. And But just by looking at things, I was like, wow, I could not even remember that. Yeah. So so I understand the balance yeah. of, of having those beautiful memories and taking you to places. And, yeah. and, and, and don't be afraid to tell strangers that story. So if you are bringing something to us and it does have that connection, that story, and, oh, I remember this when I'm... Don't, don't be afraid to tell us that you know, like we, we need to know those stories that get attached mm. to that object um, because that will travel with that object no matter where it goes and that will be the story that travels with that object. So, yeah, I think, um, I mean, and then there's the other people like me who I love Lego. <laughs> mm -hmm. have, Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Harry Potter Lego thing going on um, and I've kept all the boxes and even all the plastic bags and it wow. drives my family nuts. But that's part of the whole Lego thing. And people do that because it, they... Did will... you purchase the Harry Potter Lego game to go with it? Because you can purchase those on PlayStation, Xbox, that sort of thing. No, no, no. It's just about the Lego. It's got to be tangible. It's just the Lego. Yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, but from a collector's point of view, that's a really big thing because it is more money. Like if mm. you've got that Lego set with the original <laughs> box, with the original bag... In, in 20 years time that will be a lot more expensive so interesting yeah. i was about to wrap it up but taylor just informed me <laughs> oh, that no. we do actually have a question from our audience so i'm gonna read it thank you for watching yeah, yeah. thanks for watching oh we got some cool comments there and <laughs> Iamon Kelly, our huh. dear friend principal from the Finuakita School. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Kelly. Kia ora, Mr. <laughs> Kelly. He says, Kia ora, Bex. Thanks for making the museum so awesome. You are innovative and always coming up with great displays. Question, how do you keep coming up with the ideas for those displays? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> um, that's a three o'clock in the morning can't sleep moment. Wow. <laughs> um, Some people say that that's the, the key moment in life to be creative. If you wake up at that time, sit down, write it down and do it. Does history tell us that? Does history say that? Well, there was, there, was the sec <laughs> there was the second sleep that I mentioned on the last show, 17th century. People were documenting the first sleep that it would get darker later e earlier in the day so people didn't have ele electricity so they would sleep wake up around that time three four be create do chores be create sun was coming up mm. and then second sleep sorry mm. yeah. beautiful yeah um or just in the shower i know that sounds really weird but that's another kind of creative if so I, you don't sing in the shower you're no. curating yeah yeah um no um we do get requests um f for instance the school room we did take the school room away and we got lots of wouldn't say complaints, <laughs> but it was like, oh no, we've come specifically for the schoolroom. Okay, so we decided to put the schoolroom back in. It was a bit of a shifty room, but we also had the opportunity at the same time to create two other spaces, um, which are really cool because it, it has a real link to our local heritage. I really should have stories. mentioned this, eh? How could I Go. not have brought this up with you? <laughs> You collaborated with Mercury Bay Area School at one I point. Did. Why did you do that? I'll <laughs> bring it up. <laughs> I love collaborating with community, with the community. Anything we can do with the community. The museum is the community space. And that it's it's for the community. So um, yes, we did. We um, collaborated with the performing arts students at Mercury Bay Area School um, to help create some of the props for our new exhibition. Um, so yeah, our exhibitions. Um, I, when I think I'm finished something else, another idea pops into the head or a uh, technology changes. So then we're kind of like, oh, okay, well, we can do this better now because we've got better technology. Um, the local story space, I really um, think about what people want to see and what people are asking to see. Um, 
the Fianga town model was one. Like people mm. really needed to understand what town used to look like and, and take them back. And so that was part of that. And so that local story space that we have, the um, space that we change three to four times a year, um, is a space that we can tell those different stories and also bring objects in, off uh, out of our um, storage space and, and onto display for a period of time so people do actually get to see some of the really cool objects that we find on a daily basis and have no idea what they are but we figure it out um, and yeah so I think it's I mean if you've if anybody's got a really great exhibition idea um, I'm all we're always always open for um, comments and um, and collaboration so um, music is one that I would really like to do because we mm -hmm. have lots of different forms of um, like records and you know, music and um, record that, that players. Gram that and, gramophone is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we've got <coughs> and we've got a little uh, what are, accordion, accordion and yeah. So we've got lots of and um, sheet music, lots of old sheet music and stuff. So we'd really like I'd like to do a music one, um, but also extend that so that we can have. Um, music playing even on the front lawn which is like you said a real central place mm -hmm. um and music inside because you know fabian came in and played on our organ and it was just amazing to hear was it in tune fabian <coughs> it was pretty good actually pretty good. There, there was some because you know you have to pump your feet so you're pumping to fill up the valves of air but nothing will happen unless you pull out you know levers that will say like oboe or double octave down below where you pull out a violin or viola sound and then it activates certain reeds or certain mm. mechanics inside that will emulate those sounds in some way. And you can mix and match them and octave up. So you get two octaves playing with one note or four octaves playing with these notes. So, yeah. um, some that didn't pull out, some didn't have handles and I tried gently pulling, <coughs> but I didn't want to pull any further. Some of the ways they're attached, you go, oh, what if we could pull Whoops. it apart? How would we do that? I did not pull it off. No, no, he did not. He did not. He did not. But yeah, so those and, you know, like a photography one, because we've got some awesome cameras as well. Mm. Um, so some of them are coming out with our technology exhibition coming up. But um, so, you know, if we did a photography one, then we could look at using some of that space for our photographers in yeah, town to actually to put dress some, up, do some cool stuff. That would yeah, be cool. So, be and for me, interaction is always part of an exhibition if you don't have interaction it's just really boring so we were about to wrap it up but now something <laughs> came to my mind and i think it's a cool question um i know that it might steer a little bit but um what do you think about um when people take down uh statues monuments that were relevant to some people but not to other people because the he the thing that i hear from the people who try to be a bit more reasonable they say it should go to a museum. What do you think, Bex? No. <laughs> when it's Kip, when it's well, <laughs> I know no, this I say like no, it's no, like no. a bit of a tricky one, but it's it's a good question, isn't it? Can I jump in and give you the the grace to uh, comport yourself and get that answer eloquently phrased? Go for it. No, 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 no. I, th <laughs> I think trying to trying to hide and eliminate history is a bad thing. Yep. I think revealing it for being what it is, is if it was something horrible. So like there's a statue in Hamilton I grew up always seeing um, in the square there. And I, I've recently heard it was taken down mm. or I don't know what's happened to it. And I think, mm. well, that's done. Why not just add a second plaque that tells a different story or says, you know, and more things to know about them. He also did these horrible things and it mm. affected these family and this time and that's a part of a history that we should always learn from. Informed. And then you go, sweet, so now yeah. that has two meanings. It's been yeah. updated. But the yeah. old version of thinking about it, you need to know the ignorance of the time. You need to know the ignorance, all the arrogance of people that came before you as lessons. It's that balance again. It's that balance and making sure that people are informed on both sides mm. so that then they can either... A, go away and find more information to, to see if they can wrestle with their own thought processes or just go, oh, okay, mm. that's that what he did. Okay, you know, now we understand why some people are a little bit grumpy and some people aren't, you know, but, but we can make that decision for ourselves. And I think museums are very much that, is we're not there to tell you that's how you should feel um, or tell you that's what you should think. Um, we're there to provide to a balance of the story and the facts 
And once you have those facts and that balance, it's up to you to do what you need to do with it. Um, and so we've gone from museums full of text, like, whoa, you'd have to be in there for like five hours just reading the text, to a little bit less text, more accurate on point text, but other f other stuff to go with it. So like vid um, digital or um, something else or unwritten text so that you just kind of get a feel for what you're standing and looking at and like the stores that we've got we haven't labeled every box and said this is a cocoa box this is a, and this is from 1950 this was no it allows you to stand there and reminisce and take go back and think huh okay and also think that's what it was like so for some of our kids who have no idea and have never seen some of those um you know, some of the stuff that's in those shops shouldn't be there. If um, if somebody knew what was in there, um, you would go, oh, my God, Bex, why did you do that? It's history and it's there. It was there. Yeah, and, and, and those words were out there. And no, we don't use those words anymore, but they're there. They're part of our history. I haven't <clears> labelled them. I haven't gone, ha-ha, look, this is – but if you see it – you my, can... my uncle found, um, I think, at his parents' house, and it was an old record collection, and one of them was titled, like, Ye Old Negro Tunes. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, this is horrible, I would get rid of it. And he was like, no, you, like, you've just lost a generation of music or a culture's music that, do we have recordings of that? That is old, it's gramophone mm. level, like it was yeah. so old and broken. Yeah. And they thought that and they called them that. What was their music? Mm. And it's gone. That, that, that got, got, it was gotten rid of. Yeah. And we never got to hear it. Like, yeah. Oh, what, what was mm. their music? I don't care. Get rid of the whatever they called them. Mm. This was someone's music from yeah. a period of time we will never be able to capture. Mm. Yeah. I hope there are records out there somewhere. Mm. So for us, I think those sorts of things, it's about the conversation. So, you know, one of the objects I found and I showed my oldest daughter and she went, oh, my God, Mum, why did they? And I was like, okay, so let's just have the conversation around what this is, you know. It was um, a sauce sticker, but it was on a boot polish, you know, and it had a N-word name, you know. So mm. let's have a discussion about that. Why was it on there? Um, let's have a discussion around, around the sauce sticker. Sorry, Nazi shoe polish? No. No, it wasn't Nazi shoe polish. It was from Australia. Oh. Mm. Oh, oh wow! So you know, it's wow. it's and it's about having it's about having those conversations around those objects and 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 looking at how it was in the time, and where we are today, and that movement, and you know, so for me, that's what we do in the museum. We're there to help you on your journey through and learning our history, but in a night in a balanced way. Just thinking on that on, the, on that record front, it's an odd sense to go. You know, this record was made, and yes, they've called it Negroes from where what whatever period of mm. time I can't remember the dates on it. But they've recorded it, so clearly it was worth something. Mm. Like if it's so meaningless and so beneath everyone, mm. clearly it was interesting. Clearly mm. it was good. Clearly there's something there. Yeah. That why would they put all the money into it? Why would they get someone to make the artwork and to itemize and label and put the words on it? Like, mm. yeah, yeah. And now it's History. gone. History. Oh, totally. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And Thanks. will it always repeat? Will it always repeat? Or are we going to get to a utopia? There you go. Final question. <sighs> the word internet's going to blow up. <laughs> yeah, it's going to blow up. <laughs> and then the museum will be where you come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bex, thank you so much. What a pleasure. We could stay here for five we hours, I but uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll bring you back at some stage, eh, Mr. Roberts? <laughs> mm, yeah? Definitely. Definitely. Cool. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you so much for educating us. <laughs> that's my pleasure, and that's my job done. Thanks. <laughs> Mr. Roberts, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. I had fun tonight. Thank you so much. For you guys at home, uh, this is a cool chat. We got to learn. We got to discuss some ideas, so make sure to visit your local museum if you are from Fitzyang, if you are from the mercury bay go check the mercury bay museum but if you are from different parts of the country different parts of the world go check it out go to the museum take your kids that take your friends that learn something <laughs> yeah boy knowledge reigns supreme do you like krs1 do you know the rapper krs1 oh we're gonna talk about hip-hop now i'll see you on wednesday <laughs> 7 p.m subscribe to our channel peace
Woo!